Disclaimer, I was invited by the Panzer Museum Monster in 2019 and 2020. In this video, we'll look at an interview with an Ukrainian officer about tanks in the Russian-Ukrainian war. That was released as a video on 28th June 2022. So it has been a while. Sadly, it has no subtitles, but Stefan S. on Twitter translated various key points. It contains some real gems and in some cases also confirms some of my assessments. I particularly like the statements regarding the German Leopards. So we will take a look at those statements and provide further context if needed on them. Be aware that I don't know if the numbering on Twitter corresponds with the order of information in the video. So let's get into it. As a second point it is noted. Second, tanks have not become useless, on the contrary, their role in the battle has become more significant and the variety of the task that they perform has widened. I'm certainly not surprised by the first part of this. As probably indicated by my video about the repeated death of the tank since its inception. Yet I must add that I would not have stated or assumed that the role would have improved. Sadly, it is not outlined in which way. Although the next point is a bit of an indicator. Third, tanks in the armed forces of Ukraine are not used like in 2014-2015, when they acted in groups of 1-2 to two tanks up to company level, 10 tanks. Now the infantry understands how to better employ synergy with tanks in battle, combined arms warfare. This is quite surprising, namely that tanks were used in groups of 1-2 to two tanks in the past, although I assume this was due to lack of material. Since from all I know the use of particular single tanks and small groups is generally discouraged or even forbidden in most doctrines. There are few exceptions, for instance in urban combat or very difficult terrain. Interesting is that the company is mentioned with 10 tanks. This likely would mean that the Ukrainian company consists of 3 platoons with 3 tanks each and 1 tank for the company commander. Similar to the Russian and Soviet tank companies. Yet there are other sources that note that Ukraine uses 4 tanks per platoon and 2 tanks in the command section. So 14 tanks per company. Of course, tank companies and tank brigades and mechanized brigades are sometimes organized differently, so this might account for this difference, but there could be other reasons like losses, etc. The part about combined arms warfare is also not surprising. Tanks without infantry support were and are generally considered very vulnerable. The next part is about captured tanks. It is noted that the soldiers were able to employ them rather easily and that in some mechanized brigades several companies are made up of captured tanks. Apparently previous training paid off and former infantrymen happily jumped into the tanks. This of course raises the question how the Russian tanks were so easily captured according to the source the reasons for this was. 9. The majority of the losses experienced by the enemy occurred because of poor training or foolish logistical managing. Many tanks were captured in mink condition in the middle of roads without fuel. This might also be related to the fact that the Russians did not expect a lot of resistance and maybe assumed that they could later retrieve their tanks. This might also explain why many of them were not destroyed by their own crews. An aspect that I missed in the interview with the former Leopard 2 gunner a few weeks ago. Thanks for people pointing that out in the comments. Additionally, it is also mentioned how captured equipment is handled. It is noted that not all equipment is officially registered yet that there are financial rewards for soldiers that capture and destroy enemy equipment. So it seems there is a bounty system in place. The next point is about Russian employment of tanks. 5. The enemy uses tanks not in platoons but in company level and larger, if there is more than a company left in a tank battalion. He uses them according to Soviet textbooks, where there are 10 tanks per 500 meters, except there are not enough tanks for a second wave as presumed in the textbooks. To be sure I asked Tech Error if this is in line with Soviet doctrine and he noted yes. It is noted in the combat regulations for the ground forces part 2 battalion regiment published in Moscow 1982. Now the lack of a second wave means that the initial losses will break the spearhead and since there is no spear left an attack won't succeed. For further context about Soviet doctrine keep this statement from Donnelly in mind. To say that they, the Soviets, deride the concept of a small army does not of course mean that they underestimate the army's concerns. They have a healthy respect for say the 1st British Corps or the 3rd US Corps. They would point out however 
that when the first British Corps has been eroded by battle, there is no second British Corps to take its place. When the Soviet Third Shock Army has been eroded in battle, there is a second wave to take its place. Unsurprisingly, a large number of points deal with maintenance and repairs of equipment. Particularly for tank repair, it is noted. 6. Both sides bring tanks 200 to 300 km behind the lines for repair. The transporting takes 5 to 6 hours. No one wants to risk a specialist capable of carrying out the repairs or the specialized machinery needed for the infield repairs. This is quite interesting. I assume that a lot of the specialized machinery that was left over from the Soviet Union probably was used up in the civilian sector after the fall of the Soviet Union. At least this could explain the discrepancy between the rather large stockpile of tanks, while there seems to be a serious lack of maintenance equipment for these tanks. But there could be other reasons for this as well. There are also several mentions about repair facilities. To quote, 14. There are three tank repair plants left in Russia, and their ability to repair tanks or pull tanks out of storage is limited, not more than 100 to 200 units per month. At the same time, the Ukrainians had a very bad experience. At one point, there was a TV report about a tank repair plant in Kiev. Shortly after airing, a Kalimar cruise missile hit the plant. This led not only to the destruction of equipment, but it particularly mentioned that many excellent specialists were lost. Meanwhile, it is also mentioned that tanks are also repaired in Europe. I assume the European Union is meant here. A single factory is able to repair 20 to 30 written off tanks per month. They have a large supply of specialists. In total, we get back two to three tank companies every month. This practice of sending tanks back to the factory is similar to what the Germans did in the Second World War with their tanks. Yet back to the current times, no countries are mentioned, yet I suspect that Poland, the Czech Republic and Romania are very likely involved here. There is also mention how tanks are upgraded with explosive reactive armor, namely with the Russian Contact 1, but also the Ukrainian NOS reactive armor. It is noted that a naked T-72M, so the expert variant of the T-72 that was common in Warsaw Pact countries, can be upgraded by 2-3 to three welders in one working day. Be aware that I suspect the working day currently doesn't account for 8 hours in Ukraine. Another point that I recently brought up in my videos as well is training. About the tank training it is noted, Sam, there are some problems with retraining tankers from T-64s to T-80s or T-72s or vice versa. This could be optimized. To add some context here, tanks are small and cramped. I only have been in a few and I am neither particularly tall nor big. But they were unpleasant generally, leaving aside the excitement and curiosity. Even in the Makava tank, which is considered quite spacious for a tank, I moved around like an old man. Additionally, a lot of parts in the tank are edgy and they don't budge. Nicholas the Chief de Moran informed me that wounds sustained from operating a tank are called tank bites. And I see why I got one from a T-55 just sliding into the turret hatch and mildly touching something with my legs. This means operating in a tank comes down to muscle memory and knowing exactly where each button, lever and sharp metal piece that might pierce your body is. Of course, there are also other elements. More modern technology might make certain steps unnecessary. Yet at the same time some new equipment will require more training, for instance night vision equipment. A lot of military training comes down to doing stuff without too much thinking, simply due to the fact that in combat every second counts and also that one might not be in the best shape, for instance lacking a lot of sleep. Similarly, Western volunteers generally ask for weapons they are used to. Additionally, it is noted about the Russian armed forces. 13. 90% of the T-80 BVMs have been destroyed. There are still T-72B3s and T-72B3Ms. Up to 900 tanks of these types have been lost. 800 remain, but there are problems with training crews for these. This is why T-62s and all model T-72s and T-80s have been brought out of service. They are elderly volunteers who served on them. For more information about the T-62, check out this video. I almost forgot, take all kill and loss claims with a huge grain of salt. For a more in-depth discussion, see this video. It is also noted that Ukrainian armed forces have some problems with making full use of night vision thermal sights from captured and European tanks, since the training is still low and the number of specialists is limited. 
be aware that this might have changed by now since this information is from June. Additionally, we should not forget that some information shared in the video might contain deliberate disinformation as well. Finally, a very important information is brought up about training and something I repeatedly noted in my video as a problem for sending various equipment. 28. Retraining of tankers onto western tanks would take around a month. Repair crews would need at least 3 to 4 months. This of course brings us directly to the sending leopard tanks discussion. As you might know, I did one about the Leopard 1 and one about the Leopard 2. And the interview in particularly mentioned Leopards. 27. We don't need Leopards right now. Send us more T-72s instead. One to two battalions of Leopards would do more harm than good. I generally don't like to play the told you so tape, but since some people think they needed to be particularly ashy in the comment section to compensate for the utter lack of understanding of real world military affairs, Here's the comment in question, which I don't read for obvious reasons. By the way, in this video the discussion was about 10 Leopards 2. This would be about company size and I specifically mentioned because the number is so low that it would not make much sense from the logistical standpoint. And here the Ukrainian officer actually noted one to two battalions would do more harm than good where the battalion consists of several companies. Anyway, back to Ukraine. They particularly note that they want to have the T-72s that are left in Europe, yet the T-72s from Africa and Asia should not be considered. I assume likely due to pure maintenance and other problems, additionally as Andrew pointed out in his review of my script, there could be also some political reasons as well. Be aware that even recently on German Mill Twitter the debate about sending leopards yes and no happened again. Finally, there are some statements about Russian and Ukrainian tanks. About Russian tanks it is noted that the T-80 BBM is the best protective one, followed by the T-90A and the T-72B with modifications. About the Ukrainian T-64 it is noted that it will be replaced after the war, adding that not many are left anyway. Additionally, that all new units are created with T-72s. And as a final important point, when it comes to the best suited tank, it depends. 25. There are circumstances where our T-64s are better than captured T-80 BVMs or T-72Bs and also vice versa. Well, not much to add here, be aware I'm not sure if the tweets directly reflect the content of the interview, but if it does, you can clearly see that a lot of information is about logistics and non-combat related aspects like training as well. This is probably less surprising for some of my viewers, particularly those that know the Panzergrenadier Commandments video. I hope you learned something new. Thanks to Stefan S. for writing these tweets. Thank you to Andrew for reviewing the script and providing feedback. Thanks to Tech Arrow for his help with Sober Doctrine. Be aware any errors are my own, also only Andrew saw the complete script. Thank you to the Panzer Museum Munster for inviting me in the past. Special thanks to all my supporters for making trips to museums and military archives possible. As always, sources are listed in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.